Vine Church London. Uh, welcome to today's um, Sunday service by live streaming. We're transmitting from London, from the United Kingdom. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise, we worship, and we adore you. We thank you for this glorious day. We worship you. We bless you, Father. Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to still be able to gather together, albeit by live streaming, and learn at your feet to hear your word. Lord God Almighty, I pray in the name of Jesus that the heavens will be open upon us today. I ask, O oh God, that you speak by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you open our eyes to hear, our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand what you are showing us, what you are saying to us. And Lord, we pray that your word would find fertile ground in our hearts, that we shall not just be hearers of your word, but we shall also be doers of your word. I pray for faith, O oh God faith to step out as we hear your voice to do that which you instruct us lord i ask father for your grace and your anointing afresh today that that which heaven is saying at this time will be declared unto us and that through this each one of us father will get to know what specifically you are saying to us Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that your work today will do a work of salvation, of deliverance, of wisdom, inspiration. Lord, that you bring your people to a place of rest in you, true rest in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. We're going to continue the series of teaching. Um, titled what on earth is going on and what am I supposed to do this series is also inspired by the phenomenon that is global at this point in time um, called coronavirus COVID-19 but not just so much about the pandemic or the plague whatever you want to call it but looking behind that one to find out what God's saying in the midst of this to his people, what's God saying to the world, and also finding out more specifically what God is saying to you and to me and to your families and what we are supposed to do. We know that this does not catch God by surprise and that God is working on the situation. I have titled today's um, session COVID-19 lockdown rest retreat and refocus I'll repeat the title very clearly COVID-19 lockdown rest retreat and refocus once I was meditating on all that is going on um, from individual uh, people's responses responses by reaction by the church at large, the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ, or lack of it even, um, the reaction of government organizations, um, and the more I pull back to just reflect on this, even global maneuvers that are going on behind the scenes, looking at what the Bible says, trying to listen to the Holy Spirit, I also just get a sense of during this quieting of, if you like, the pace of life. Is God trying also, in the midst of this, trying to get our attention and have some things to say to us? And what might those things be about? And how do we need to tune in to hear what God is saying? Now, in the Bible, we know that God um, 
is a God of work and rest. So, for example, right in the beginning of the Bible, if you look at um, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. So we want to look at the God of work and rest, the God that has put a principle of work and rest in, in, his, in his word and in the way that he has created the world and fashioned people. Now, Genesis chapter 2 talks about the heavens and the earth. And then on, in verse 2, it says that on the seventh day, God ended his work. So this is Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Why does God need to rest? He is God. He doesn't get tired. The Bible tells us he does not get tired. We see that in Isaiah 40. Yet, the Bible also tells us that he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then look at verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day. He sanctified the seventh day. Why? Because he rested from all his work which he had created and which he had made. And then verse 4 tells us this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. This principle of work and rest, as we go through the Old Testament, we see it established quite a lot. In fact, the, the seventh day, which is also known as Sabbath or Shabbat, is then became an ordinance that God gave to the people um, of Israel, the people of, his, of, of that time. So, if we look at um, Exodus chapter 31, Exodus chapter 31, Exodus chapter 31 from verse 16 to 17, Exodus 31, 16 to 17. Uh, in fact, let's back up to verse 16. Yeah, verse 16. Therefore, in fact, no, hold on. Uh, okay, let's start from verse 12 to get the context. Exodus 31 from verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So we see this phrase, this word, sanctify, being used again when rest is mentioned. In this case, when Sabbath is mentioned. In Genesis chapter 2, we saw that when God rested on the seventh day, he tells us that he sanctified it. So here, we see that word also coming up in conjunction with Sabbath. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Then verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. So some of the things we are seeing in conjunction with Sabbath, you know, God sanctifies it, it is holy. And then it goes on telling the people of Israel at that time, we know that this is Old Testament. We're gonna to come to the New Testament and what this might mean uh, in terms of Christianity, we also know that the keeping of the law of Sabbath has been abolished uh, when Jesus came. But nevertheless, we'd also find out as we go on that yet God still talks about a rest for the people of God, for Christians. But to understand the New Testament rest that God is talking about and this principle of work and rest, we just need to go back to how it all started how that principle was established. Now, you shall keep the Sabbath, verse 14, therefore it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. So the, the, the day of rest, the Sabbath, it, it was a day that God said to the people, you shall not work. 
<laughs> it was a period of enforced no work, so to say, by law. It was a period of um, rest that God had determined for his people. Verse 15, work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, throughout their generations. So this principle of work and rest that was enshrined in the Sabbath is something that God has put um, as, as, as assigned to the children of Israel throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Perpetual means everlasting. We also see in verse 17 that this Sabbath is a sign, the Bible says, between God and the children of Israel forever. So we see the word perpetual in verse 16. We see the word forever in verse 17. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And we know that he didn't just make the heavens and the earth for the people of Israel, he made it for all men. So God, in establishing the Sabbath law and the principle of work and rest, right here in verse 17 of Exodus 31, takes us back to creation to say this principle was also established or put in place when I created the heavens and the earth. Now, if the God that does not get tired that does not need rest, then tells us that he rested from his works after six days, and on the seventh day he rested, might he be establishing for us a principle of rest, of work and rest, not just for the people of Israel, but for people in general. Verse 18, and when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, the tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. And this leads us to Sabbath now being enshrined in the Ten Commandments. Sabbath being enshrined in the Ten Commandments. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter chapter 5. So Deuteronomy chapter 5 is where in the Bible we have the Ten Commandments laid out. And when you go to verse 12, one of the Ten Commandments was this. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy which means to sanctify it because God has sanctified it. Now, to sanctify means to set apart for God. To sanctify means to set apart for God or God has set apart for himself. To sanctify it as the Lord your God commanded you. Verse 13. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And then he says to them, as you think about the Sabbath, as to why you are doing this, verse 15, remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt. So the day of rest is also a day of reflection. It's a day of remembrance. It's a day of thinking back to us as Christians. We were slaves before we became Christians. We were slaves of sin. All right. The times of sin, you could call those the days when we were in Egypt, inverted commas. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out. God saved us. 
He pulled us out from that world, the world of sin that leads to death, and he brought us into a new world of life in Christ Jesus by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. And it pulled you by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And this law, in the Ten Commandments, a commandment is a command, is an order, is a law, sits alongside of thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not have false idols, thou shalt honor your father and your mother, and so on and so forth. You shall not commit adultery. The more I reflect on what's going on, the more I am convinced that God is calling his people aside and he said, let's talk. He's calling his people aside and it's saying, reflect. He's calling his people aside and it's saying, retreat. He's calling his people aside and he's saying, refocus. What on earth is God, what on earth is going on and what shall I do? And I believe one of the things that God is asking us to do during this period of lockdown, which we pray would soon be over, but before it's fully over, let's take full advantage of it. And I believe one of the things that God is saying to us in how we can take advantage of it is to take it as a time of rest, rest from our labors, rest from the rat race, rest from the restlessness and let's move into restfulness. Rest from certain habits and mindsets that just make us <laughs> sometimes be like a hamster that's going round and round in circle on the hamster wheel. Rest and think. Rest and receive. Rest and be refreshed. Rest by taking a withdrawal, a retreat, and rest by refocusing. Retreat does not mean defeat. Retreat can be a military, a strategic military action to redeploy, to move away from things that seem not to be working so that you can have a better plan for what to do. In the same way, refocus, if you can imagine if you have a camera and if it's out of focus and you begin to tilt, I mean, move the lens around a bit, then things begin to get back into focus and they become sharper, they become clearer. And then when you have a sharp focus, you press the shutter down and then you capture it. In the same way is a time that God is pulling us um, aside and he's saying, refocus. All the fuzzy ideas, the fuzzy thoughts about the future, projects that you have, plans that you have, and it just seems to be a struggle. Retreat. Come unto me that labor. And in me you will find rest. And God is calling his people to come and find rest in him. Get vision, get clarity of purpose, and also to be empowered to now go forward to accomplish what he has set for them to do. So retreat is a military strategic withdrawal. In Latin, the word retreat means to pull back. Now, these are some of the reasons why you would retreat and pull back. To retreat from the world, the busyness of the world, the fast-paced rat race, to pull back so that you can get inspired. It's difficult to get inspired in the midst of non-stop 24-7 activity. To pull back so that you can make space for your mind to become spacious. To pull back so that you can mentally detox. So that you can mentally detox. So many of us Whew. stuff have been going on in our minds for years and it just seems like non-stop. Um, some are about plans for the future, concerns and worries. 
Some are about challenges at work and work colleagues and bosses and subordinates. Some are about family situations. And it just seems nonstop. To pull back, to reflect, to think over things, but not just think, but to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So that, because in the multitude of voices and activities, sometimes it's difficult to hear God clearly. To pull back to envision, again, this is going back to this idea of refocusing. Vision is about sight. It's interesting, there's been some play of words on 2020 and vision. So many ministries in years, years ago were talking about vision 2020. You know, 2020 talks about perfect, perfect sight and perfect vision. We're now in the year 2020 and, and many are making connection with that. But to pull back, to refocus and to get clarity, to pull back, to create free thinking and meditation time, to pull back, to create free thinking and meditation time, to pull back, to make necessary changes in your life, in flight, in the midst of the flurry of the busyness of life, it's difficult to begin to make the necessary changes to habits, um, to, to schedules. But and when, you, when you pull back, you are able to uh, practice and enshrine new practices and new habits, which after lockdown, you can then, with the help of God, and with determination continue to now implement to pull back to rediscover yourself to rediscover life's objectives to pull back to rediscover purpose are you where God wants you to be are you in the center of God's plan for your life this is an opportunity to reflect on that and to begin to make the necessary tweaks some of which will take time to reflect and to put in place. To pull back away from life's, from what life circumstances have forced on you. For some of us, the summation of our existence at this point in time have been determined by the circumstances of life. But we are not to be led by circumstances, nor are we meant to, be, to make decisions based on circumstances we are to be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, to be led by the Holy Spirit, we have to hear from the Holy Spirit. So th this is a time of concentrated learning from God. Now, we said that it's to pull back, to get inspired. Inspired or inspiration means to break into. So to break into I mean, sorry, to breathe, to breathe into the breath, to breathe into. So it means to breathe life into life, to breathe the life of God into your life. So it's a time of being pulled back for that to happen. To be inspired, you have to make space for it. And to make space for it, you have to pull back from normal routine of life. And I believe these are some of the ideas behind the principle of Sabbath or rest, of work and then rest. And then you work six days and then you rest on the seventh day. And there seems to be like a ratio of six to one then. Not trying to make any huge doctrine out of that, just talking about what scripture says. Now, Sabbath in the Bible, of course, of course, on the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day in the Old Testament. But we also have in, uh, in, in secular application, especially in the academia, in the academic world, we have the word called sabbatical. Now, sabbatical is an academic year, school year, where the person taking the sabbatical, the lecturer, um, does no teaching, is free from teaching, and then he devotes that time to what? To research, to writing, to travel, maybe even to visit other institutions and other establishments that are not even in the academic world. Why? 
because it's an opportunity to reflect, to review, and to be inspired to come back sharper and more powerfully. Some of the requirements for, well, before we go to that, also in the Bible, we see that um, there was an entire year that God, apart from the, the day of Sabbath, which is the seventh day, there's also an entire year of rest. Look at Leviticus um, chapter 25, verse 3. Leviticus 25, verse 3. Now, Leviticus 25, let's start from verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Even the land, God was saying to them, shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. For it is a year of rest for the land, and the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you. Your male and female servants, your hired man and the stranger who dwells with you. For your livestock and the beasts that are in your land, all its produce shall be for food. So again, we, we see that even God, apart from saying to the people, you as a person must rest, he was also saying the land needed to rest. And for man, after every six days, for the land, after every seven, after, after um, every six years. And then it's a whole year for the land, it's a whole day um, for man. Straight after that particular one, you see it was still in Leviticus 25, the very next verse, verse 8. We now see the year of Jubilee mentioned. And then it says in verse 8, and you shall count seven Sabbaths. So we've gone from the Sabbath day, the seventh day, to the Sabbath year, the seventh year, now to the year of Jubilee. So you shall count um, seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. So remember, a Sabbath is seven. So seven Sabbath of years is seven times seven, 49 years. Seven times seven, and the time of the seventh Sabbath of years shall be to you 49 years. Verse 9. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year. You see that word again, consecrate. Um, the same as what we saw before, sanctify, holy, consecrate. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land, throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possession. And each of you shall return to his family. So there is a focus there of a return to family, a return to family relationships, a, a, a period of rest, a, a year of jubilee, of freedom, of liberty. Might God in the midst of all of this be asking his people, to rest, to reflect, to refocus? I personally believe so. Even if God is not specifically saying so, we can take advantage of it. We can take advantage of it to do all of that. Because he said it's a time to return to your family. Now, people, even if they were planning and thinking of how to return to family and get everybody together, um, but they didn't have an opportunity. The lockdown has provided the opportunity. <laughs> the children are back at home. The adults are at home. Everybody is home. So why don't we take full advantage of this? So, 
The key requirements for keeping the Old Testament Sabbath were you can't leave your house, Exodus 16, 29. You can't even build a fire, Exodus 35, verse 3. You cannot cause anyone to work, Deuteronomy 5, 14. And breaking the Sabbath could result in death, Exodus 31, 15, Numbers 15, 32 to 35. Let me go through those again. The requirements for keeping the Old Testament Sabbath, and I say Old Testament, you can't leave your house. Exodus 16, 29. You can't build a fire. Exodus 35, 3. You can't cause anyone to work. Deuteronomy 5, 14. And breaking the Sabbath could result in death. 31, 15. Numbers 15, 32 to 35. Does that sound similar in some ways to what we're going through? Can't leave your house. Can't go to work. And should you break the lockdown people could become afflicted could die as a result of the plague now we need to remember in balancing this up the reason we are going into the Old Testament is just to establish to understand the principles that God established with regards to work and rest which he put together in the Sabbath which was observed on the seventh day, on the seventh year, and after seven Sabbaths of years, on the fiftieth year. But we need to remember that for the New Testament Christian believer, which goes across Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, everybody, as long as you are a believer in Christ, the requirements for keeping the Sabbath was abolished at the cross. Let me let me say that again. The requirements, the requirements for keeping the Sabbath law as established in the Old Testament was abolished at the cross. But the principle, the principle of work and rest was not abolished. Uh, the requirements were abolished, and you see that in Colossians 2, 16, Romans 14, 5, Galatians chapter 4, and Romans chapter 6, verse 14. But there is a the Bible in the New Testament, nevertheless, talks about the day of rest and the fact that we should, as New Testament believers, as Christians and as people, we should labor to enter into the rest. And that's an interesting phrase of expression, labor to enter into rest. Now, rest naturally is a place where you don't labor, but it says labor and then after the labor comes rest. So you labor to enter into the rest. So in your labor, ensure that your laboring will take you into the rest. There is a rest that God has provided for his people. And to enter into that rest, you have to labor the right way. Laboring the wrong way might mean that you miss the rest. The time of reflection, the time of freedom, the, the time of relaxing. All right. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 3, and we take this from there. So we're now moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament application um, to us. Hebrews chapter 3, and I'll read from verse... I'll read from verse 7. Hebrews 3, 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you will hear his voice, let's stop there for a moment. If you will hear his voice. So the Holy Spirit is speaking. The Holy Spirit is uttering his voice. Some will hear his voice, some will not. But if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So for those that hear his voice, some will harden their hearts, some will not. But the advice in verse 8 is, do not harden your hearts. So firstly, what's the Holy Spirit saying? Secondly, I need to make sure that I don't harden my heart. To harden your heart is to hear it all right and then choose not to do it. To, to hear it to the point where, although you hear it, you are no longer sensitive to it and you're not walking in it. 
It's to harden your, your heart is to hear it and yet choose to do otherwise. But I believe these are the times that God is speaking to us and he wants us to not just hear what he's saying to us corporately and especially individually, but also to obey his voice. Following this through will prepare you, prepare us, prepare me for the next phase of what is around the corner. Everybody says it nowadays. Things are not going to get back to how they used to be. Some things have now changed permanently. To a large extent, it's true. But in the midst of this, of all this, for those that are in Christ, for the people of God, is a great time. It's a time of hope. It's a time of peace. It's a time of joy. Maybe next Sunday we'll talk about the peace in the storm. Because that was another message that's been bouncing around in my mind. But this is the one that I believe God wants me to focus on today. But it's a time to tap into the peace. Remember, Jesus said that my peace I give to you. My joy I give to you, not as the world gives. So there is a joy and a peace that is dependent on the world. And then there's the one that comes straight from the presence of God. The ones that the peace and the joy that come from God directly are not affected by circumstances of life because they are not dependent on the circumstances of life. And it is in that peace, in that place of peace, being still to hear from him that connects you to the peace of God, that you are able to receive the instruction, the grace, the strength, and the wisdom concerning what lies ahead. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. Do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was, look at verse 10, therefore I was angry with that generation. Why was God angry with that generation? Thank you for that question. The answer is in the next two sentences. One, because they said, I mean, God said, they always go astray in their hearts. So the first reason God was angry with them is that they always go astray in their hearts. The second reason, because they have not known my ways. So this time, this lockdown time, is a time to reflect and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to reflect ways by which we might have gone astray in our hearts. And when he shows any of those things, to not deny it, but to confess, to repent and to confess our sins and to begin to make adjustments. Why? Because God wants to make us more fruitful. And it says in verse 11, So I swore in my wrath concerning them, they shall not enter my rest. But for us, look at verse 12, Beware, brethren, so God speaks to us. Now, it says, Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So, unbelief is not exercising faith towards God. Unbelief is 100% trusting in what we think are our own abilities when it was even God that gave us those abilities in the first place. The Bible says that what do you have that you have not received? Some people say they are self-made, whatever you want to call them. Well, I haven't seen anyone that made themselves, that created themselves. We are all God-made. There's no one that is self-made. So lest there be any, verse 12, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So the unbelief leads to departing from the living God. So we must not depart from the living God. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. So exhort one another daily, encourage one another daily while it is called today. So this word is a word of encouragement, it's a word of exhortation. Why do we need that ex exhortation? Verse 13 tells us, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. And this is the time 
to re- allow the Holy Spirit to check our hearts so that there is no hardness in the heart that is caused by deceitfulness of sin. And then verse 14, For we have become partakers of Christ, if, so it's conditional, you become partakers of Christ if you fulfill this condition. And what's the condition? If you hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. If you hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The marathon race is not over until you get to the finish line. The Christian work is a marathon race. The finishing line, as long as we are still physically alive, is still ahead of us. The finishing line is when Jesus comes and we go up in rapture or we die, whichever comes earlier. Until then, we continue with the race. And we need to hold the beginning of our confidence of that race steadfast to the end. How did you know Christ? How did you get saved? What does salvation mean to you? What did it mean to you then? What does it mean to you now? Where is your trust? Where is your faith? In whom do you have it? Hold your confidence and your confession, the confession of your faith, all the way to the end. Why does the Bible tell us this? Because the shaking might make some to be shaken off, such that their confidence might no longer be in Christ, in the living God. And sin can come in. And because sin is temporarily pleasurable and can seem to give certain benefits, might give the impression that it's okay. And that's where deception comes in. Deceitfulness is a word that comes from deception. And one of the signs of the end times is deception. At some other point, um, some other um, service, live stream service, we'll talk about how to protect your heart from the deception of the last days. So that will be a session on its own. But in the meantime, don't allow sin to let your heart become hardened. True, because sin is deceitful. Sin is very deceitful. So we see here that God is calling his people into a rest. Look at uh, chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains. So there is a promise that was in the Old Testament, and that promise remains even now to us New Testament believers and to Christians and to those, and it's available to anyone that wants to be part of this through Christ Jesus. That promise remains. And what's that promise? Is the promise of entering his rest. That promise remains. That promise has not left. But how? He says, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So it is possible to come short of this rest, of entering into God's rest. It's possible to miss it. It's possible to miss it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So God is calling his people back to faith through his word. When you hear the word of God, obey it. When you hear the word of God, believe it. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you know that it's the Holy Spirit and it is backed up by the word of God, the Bible, Disobedience would lead to sin, which will lead to hardness of heart, which will lead to deceitfulness, and which will lead to apostasy. Sin can steal your faith. Sin can steal your faith. Verse 3, For we who have believed, do enter that rest. So there is a rest. For us now there is a rest. As he had said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's those that did not believe. 
although the works were finished from the foundations of the earth. So you see this principle of works and rest again. So here in the New Testament, God is saying to us, although the works were already finished from the foundation of the earth, but there is a rest for his people. Verse 4, For he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So now, in the New Testament, God is referring us back to the principle, Old Testament principle of work and rest. Verse 5, And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, it remains that you must enter it, it remains that I must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. So what keeps us from not getting into God's rest is disobedience. So he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not burden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Verse 9. There remains, and, and the tense there is present continuous. So even today, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. There is a rest place that God has for you. There is a rest place that God has for me. Verse 10. For those he who has entered God's rest, his rest, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So we begin to close now. God ceased from his work and entered into rest. God says that there is a rest for us where it is not of works anymore, but of faith. And God says in Hebrews 4.10 that we, to enter into God's rest, we have to cease from works. Now, works talks about the flesh. All right? So the more you align your lifestyle, your thoughts, your priorities, the foundation of everything that you build, your life, your ministry, your finances, your work, your business, your relationships, align everything to the Bible, to the Word of God, to the principles of the Word of God, then you begin to position yourself to walk in that place of rest. The opposite of rest is stress. <laughs> there are too many people that are stressed, even Christians. That's because it's, it's all been about works and struggle. But when we begin to get in, begin to do it God's way, Yes, we still have to apply effort, we still have to work, we still have to labor, but that labor will lead to rest. And through that labor, there will be peace and there will be joy, no matter what might be going on in the world. You need to hear the voice of God and obey it. You need to be able to enter into his promise for you. The promises of God are a place of fulfillment. The fulfillment of his purposes for you, I know the plans that I have towards you, says God, of good and not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. Jeremiah 29, 11. In the promises of God and by the leading of God, you will find the rest that God has for you. In the will of God, there is rest. I pray that God leads you by the still waters, according to Psalm 23, where you will hear his voice. And where you will hear is leading. He leads me beside still waters. The still waters are a place of quiet, uh, a place of reflection, a place of peace. And God is bringing you into that place. He's calling you into that place. May God bring you into the paths of righteousness. Because there are other paths, like paths of unrighteousness and sin that leads to deception. May God bring you to the place of the fresh water, green pastures. Sheep feed on grass, the green pastures. Green talks about the freshness, the nutrients in the food for the, for the sheep. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God shall man live. In Psalm 23 verse 2, He makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. Verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And because of this, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, follow me. I won't have to strive for it. Goodness will follow you. Mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, all the days of your life including the days of COVID-19. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. I give you praise, O God, and I thank you for your people. I thank you for your word. That even in this seemingly global emergency, you have good stored for your people. For all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. All things, not some things, all things, seemingly good things, seemingly bad things, all things, including COVID-19. And Lord, we pray for every single person in the midst of this global pandemic that you will reveal what you are saying to us, that you will help us to come into that place of rest. Lord, as you call us further unto yourself to rest, to retreat, to refocus, I pray, O oh God, that you will give us individual guidelines and strategies for this and that you prepare us for the things that you have ahead of us. Father, we thank you for this. We give you praise. We give you praise, Lord. We worship you. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, Lord, I pray that you help your people to be desperate for you right now, to press in into your presence to desire you more than their necessary food. I pray, O oh God, for the heart cry that reaches places that other prayers cannot reach. As the deer pants after the water brook, so does my heart pant after you. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you help us during this period for our hearts to pant after you. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that your people, you bring us into a place of prayer, intense, deep prayers, that would cause a shift and a displacement in the heavenlies. I pray, O oh God Almighty, that you bring us to a place of sacrificial giving of our time, of our money, of our personal agendas and ambitions for the sake of your kingdom. And Lord, that you will cause your accumulated blessings to reach a tipping point for your people. I pray, O oh God Almighty, that you bring us to a place where, like Jacob, we will wrestle with you and we will prevail and that our names will be changed by our names being changed which means every negative things that we have called ourselves every negative things that people have called us that you will change that name you will change it to whom you have already ordained for us i pray that you bring us into a place of prayer where such transformation takes place behind the scenes as we come into you in prayer lord i pray that lord you said in your word in the book of Revelations chapter 5 verse 8, Revelations chapter 5 verse 8, that you collect the prayers of your people like tears that are treasured in bowls of incense in heaven. And I ask in the name of Jesus that you bring us to that point where prayers, intense prayers, the prayers of the righteous that are effective, the effective and fervent prayers of the righteous, that make that releases releases powerful changes that you bring us to that place of intense intercession in the name of jesus that our prayers oh god will ascend before you and be acceptable to you father i pray for incredible acts of obedience that will be not will not be like those who are disobedient will be obedient the obedience that releases lasting generational legacies that that will be our portion in the name of jesus in Isaiah 58, 12, you said you will cause our light to shine out of obscurity. Father, we pray that during this period, you will bring us out of obscurity into the light. In the name of Jesus, I pray, O God Almighty, as we wait on you, that this will be days where acts of faith that causes God to release nations unto us are released. You said, ask of me and I will give you the nations. Lord, that during this period, it will be a period of taking hold 
of nations, of projects, of, of um, purposes, callings, assignments that you have for every single one of us. Thank you, Father, for this. Lord, I pray that this will be days of prayers of repentance that activate the manifestation of the prophecies of God. When Daniel began to intercede for the land and he was confessing the sin of the land, you began to show him about the future for his people, for himself, for his people, and for the rest of the world. And I pray that this will be that time that we begin to confess and repent of our sins. Individually, as a family, as a nation, even as churches, we thank you, Father, for this. In the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless.